Thank you. Thank you, Christine. I'm so sorry, Christine, you have to leave. Uh, that's a, a really perfect timing. Uh, I'm sorry, I have to monitor the room and let people in where I'm actually uh, doing the presentation. So bear with me for a little bit. Uh, there are just uh, still um, people coming in. Uh, so I'm gonna try my best to do both at the same time because uh, we have quite a few people still coming in. Um, All right. Can you all hear me? Could um, could you could you all hear me and see me and see the slide? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Great. Yeah. So I think I think uh, someone gave a suggestion that why don't you let people in for five minutes and then start. So yeah, so I'll probably just wait a little bit, just a little bit. Uh, we have plenty of time to go through my presentation today. Uh, so I just give people a little bit of time to log in and thank you. Um, I'm gonna change to the second slide so you can read uh, what we offer at the LGBT Center. Why are you waiting? So I'll give you some things to do while you're waiting for a um, people to join. Uh, but we will start at um, just about four minutes. Uh, we'll start at 2.10 um, and just uh, we, we do have enough time to go, go over all my presentation today. Um, great. All right. It seems like it seems like most people is already in. Uh, so I might I might just get started soon. Um, yeah, uh, I, I think I can get started, uh, and I'm just going to continue monitor the room. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm sorry, Christine had to leave. Um, uh, as uh, the people that just uh, arriving, just arrived, uh, Christina uh, from the San Francisco Public Library. Um, this event is actually put up by the San Francisco Public Library, but she had to leave because there was a fire alarm going on in their building. So she had to evacuate. So, um, but she, hopefully she's gonna come back very soon. Um, uh, I'm gonna do a quick introduction of myself and the, the program at the San Francisco LGBT Center. Uh, my name is Eddie Tang. Uh, I am the small business consultant for the, uh, I manage the small business program uh, at the San Francisco LGBT Center. And um, I am also a business owner myself for about eight years. So I can definitely connect with a lot of you here. Um, the San Francisco Small Business Center, uh, sorry, San Francisco, um, LGBT Center is a community center in San Francisco, mostly focusing folks in the LGBT, uh, LGBT community. Um, but our small business program is open to anyone. Actually, the whole center is open to anyone. You, uh, you know, it could be anyone and you can come to us for support. Um, the, these are the few things we do at the center. Uh, most uh, focus is on business one-on-one -on -one coaching and one-on-one -on -one consulting. Uh, and my main focus on business is on business planning, uh, and that's what we're doing today: uh, small business plan and uh, business strategy, finance. Uh, we work with a lot of other local nonprofit that provide support to small business as well. I can give you a few names: for example, Main Street Launch Opportunity Fund, uh, Meta, Renaissance Entrepreneur Center. We work we work with all these nonprofits together to provide support to local residents who want to start a business or who is running a business. Um, if there's anything that I cannot do at the LGBT Center, I can 
uh, usually refer or find the resources we refer you to. Uh, for example, if you need free legal service, uh, we know where to refer you to. Or if you need funding to start, help you start a business, we have a few nonprofit that can provide funding uh, to people who want to start a small business, uh, who uh, we can refer you to as well. Uh, we can also help you prepare uh, to apply for different loans through these nonprofit. Um, the another thing we do is small business workshops. So we at this LGBT center we host about two small business workshop every month. Um, and sometimes it's marketing, sometimes legal, finance, workshop, accounting, pretty much anything related to small business. Uh, we usually will have a workshop and uh, I host some of the workshop, but sometimes we'll in invite other industry experts to host workshop with me. Um, so that's another thing we do is uh, a regular small business workshop. And I want to mention that so far, all our program at the LGBT Center, all our program, our small business program at the LGBT Centers are free. Um, um, as long as you're a resident in San Francisco, you can always just reach out to us to receive support uh, from us. Uh, we host street fair. So it's about two uh, street fair we host uh, at the center. Um, basically, it's like marketplace. People can come set up table. Uh, sell their product and promote their business. Uh, one usually is before Pride and then another one is before the holiday. Uh, we didn't do it in the last two years for obvious reason uh, for because of pandemic, but hopefully we will start doing that again after the pandemic. Uh, for those of you who are a woman owned small business, uh, we are also one of the TA for the city of San Francisco who can help you apply for this grant. Uh, this is called San Francisco Women, Women's Entrepreneurship Fund. Uh, it's a 5, 000, uh, up to $5,000 grant for women run small business in San Francisco. Uh, some of the key requirements are a has to be at least 50% owned by women, has to be a full-time business. Um, sorry, I'm just letting more people in. So it has to be a uh, full-time business, has to be in business for, uh, sorry, had to be full-time business, had to be at least 50% owned by women, uh, has to be in business for at least one year and generate some income. Uh, we can help you. You do have to apply through one of us. Uh, so if you are a woman run small business or, or you know someone who is a woman run small business, feel free to connect them with me. Uh, we do have a more systematic training program. Uh, it's a nine weeks training program where we'll go through one topic every week uh, to help people build a business from the ground up. A, usually we purposely maintain this as a small, very, very small group. Usually it's between six to eight people in this group. Um, again, this is a free training program as well. Um, currently we have a corporate sponsor for this program. So if you go through this program and finish all required assignment, you will receive a $400 grant uh, from our corporate sponsor. And on week nine, you actually will present your business to a panel of judges. And the two winner, there are two winner will also receive a, one will receive $1,500 grant and one will receive $1,000 grant. Um, Again, it's a very intense training program. You have to do pretty much do one presentation every week. Uh, but people, uh, I see a lot of business, um, new business owners completely transform their business throughout this program. Um, so the target, um, my target audience, I would say would be people who has a business idea and hasn't started a business yet, or people who already have their business, but they're running their business. It's probably for within the first one or two years uh, and they have some challenge growing their business and this will be the right program for them. But it really depends. If you feel like it's something that will benefit you, you can definitely uh, reach out to me. Uh, for example, our last cohort was someone that's in business for 20 years. And after our interview with him, we realized that he could really benefit from this program because he's making a changes to his business and we still accept him in this program. So this is my contact information, uh, sbconsultant at sfcenter.org. Uh, you can always email me if you have any questions. Um, so just because I am here by myself, um, I, I asked you to 
And because we have quite a few people uh, in this uh, class today or, or workshop today, uh, I ask you to put any questions uh, on the chat. Uh, if you don't know, under, in, the, in the control panel, there is a, uh, a uh, there is a, on the control panel. There's a chat window. So you can always put your put your chat there. I will pause a uh, regularly to answer questions uh, throughout the workshop, and I also leave time in the end of the workshop, at the end of the workshop, to answer more of your questions. Uh, some people ask ask me to tell you a little bit more about my own success <laughs> story. Um, so a little bit, I guess, more of my background. Um, I. Um, I started out as an engineer. I was an engineer for about four years and then got into financial in got into financial industry. I was a financial advisor for a large, large bank and managed you know, about $100 million portfolio for the bank. Uh, and then one day I just realized, you know, I, I, was, I was managing high, uh, high net worth individual. Um, one day I just realized I really much prefer to help small business. Uh, a lot of the client I helped, they're, they're so well off, they really probably don't need my help. So I decided I came to San Francisco. So after 10 years working at financial industry, I came to San Francisco, uh, received my MBA from the University of San Francisco and started my business eight years ago. And I, I never look back. Uh, so that's uh, currently I'm managing the small business program for the LGBT center, but I'm also working with San Francisco Tech Council. Uh, we're running a program uh, it's helping people 50 and over uh, to start a business in San Francisco. So you can reach out to me as well if you're interested in the, the other program. It's, again, it's helping people 50 and over start a business in San Francisco. Uh, I'm doing, also doing uh, some consulting work for other, a few other nonprofit here as well. Okay. Um, well, some people ask me, so if you have any questions about what I just mentioned or, or a, the program at the LGBT Center, feel free to ask them here. Um, the, yes, someone asked me, I think someone's asking me about the women's grant. So the women's grant, you have to be a full-time business. And the way to determine your full-time business is that you have to be actively working your business for, I think it's 32 hours a week or generate about $25,000 uh, net income a year uh, to qualify for the San Francisco Women's Entrepreneurship Fund. Um, we are a San Francisco LGBT center is a nonprofit, but most of the small business we help are not nonprofit. We mostly help for-profit business. Um, we do, I do have a uh, knowledge with nonprofit, so I can definitely help people with nonprofit as well, but most of the business we help are for-profit business. And yeah, so the business we help could be just one person business or a business with multiple client, uh, sorry, more, many employees. So it really depends. Uh, as long as you're a San Francisco business, uh, you can reach out to us. Um, yeah. Uh, I will ask uh, Chris, Christine, but I believe the, the recording can be sent to you. And I, I will send you the slide send the workshop slide to you as well, to everyone here as well. So you have my content and, and, and the slide. Um, all right. So everyone is here. I believe you're here because you wanna write a business plan and you don't know how to start. And that's, you know, that's not a, a unique situation. I think a lot of times people need to write a business plan. They kind of put it off or just because simply because they don't know what to be, what needs to be in there um, and how to write each section. So, and sometimes you have to join a probably a week's training program that we do or many other organizations do in, this, in San Francisco or um, in the Bay Area to learn about write a business plan. And my goal with this workshop is really condense that, that a week's program into this an hour or one and a half hour, uh, so that you have a basic understanding of how to write a business plan uh, so that you can start writing a business plan. Uh, so yeah, so it's really condensed a, a very long training program into those two hours. Uh, hopefully you can learn how to write a business plan. Before you start writing a business plan, you always wanna ask yourself, and I think every everyone, you probably already have a reason you wanna write a business plan. 
these are some of the reasons people write a business plan. One is you apply for a loan, uh, especially if you're a new, brand new business, and if you try to apply for a loan uh, from a, if you try to apply for a loan from a bank, most likely they will say no. Even though you have a fully written business plan, they will say no, just because banks are usually conservative and they usually want, they're usually, sometimes they say bad words looking. What do you mean by bad words looking? Because they wanted to look at your financial statement for probably two, three years before they lend you money. Um, I shouldn't say, I should say banks are more risk averse. So they wanted to look at your, your proven financial record before they lend you money. Uh, a lot of nonprofit I mentioned like Main Street Launch, Opportunity Fund, uh, uh, Meta, Working Solution, PVC, uh, these nonprofit in the Bay Area, they will help you, uh, they will give you a loan, even if you're a new small business owner. Of course, not guarantee everyone will approve. They, they do still have to look at you know, different things. And one of them is business plan, uh, especially if you're really new in business, uh, if you're a brand new business owner, uh, chances that they probably want, us, want to see a business plan because that's probably the only thing they have go by to know how much you understand about this business. And then raise capital. Um, as we all know, San Francisco is, you know, there is a lot of startup in San Francisco and um, a lot of investors wanted to see your business plan. Um, lately, a lot of investors will ask you for a, a more condensed version of business plan. We call them pitch deck. But once they are interested, a lot of them will still come back to you and say, hey, I still want to see a full business plan. So when you raise capital, that's when you need to have a business plan. Apply for grants. Um, sometimes the people provide grant will probably have a pretty short form for you to complete. It's kind of a short version of business plan. Sometimes they do ask for a, a longer business plan as well. A, um, but the most, like, I think the most important reason you write a business plan is really for yourself to guide your action. And uh, business plan should be a plan that you constantly update as your business changes. All right, so as I mentioned, a lot of people don't write a business plan because they don't know what should be in it. And, and, and what they do is they go Google and they probably find a thousand different business plan template on uh, when they Google it. And you, you could probably find a thousand different business plan template. But if you look at 10 of them, you probably realize they're pretty much more or less the same. They kind of structure it differently. They probably format it differently. Uh, some of them is probably more sophisticated. They create an app that so you can go through the app and do it step by step. But the key component, uh, the key components of the business plan, they're all the same. So executive summary, your product and service, your target market and, and, and target customer your marketing plan and marketing strategy, your industry and competitive analysis, your company's organizational development plan, your operational plan, and your revenue model and financial plan. So some orders are different. Some business plan have probably have a different order, but they're more or less the same. So I'm gonna get into every section to you give you more information about how to complete each section of your business plan. All right, so I'm pretty sure you all heard that people have very, very short attention span now, right? People probably have 30 seconds for you. Um, you know, that people just, this is a, 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 a uh, this is a time where there's so much information out there and people just don't have a lot of time to go through all the information. Uh, same as investors or same as loan officer. And so a lot of investors will probably only read one section of your business plan, which is the executive summary. So this is probably the most important part of a business plan. Uh, you the goal of this part of your business plan is you need to get people's attention. Uh, um, you need to attract people's attention. You need to get people interest in your business, in yourself through this section. 
If you don't get people's interest, they will not go and look at other sections. So this, this is the most important part of your business plan. Uh, it should be on the, the, at the front of your business plan, but you should write this part last. Again, because it's an executive summary, it's a summary of everything else in the business plan. So you should write this last, but it should be on the first page of your business plan. Okay. Uh, and some people ask me, how many page should I have on a business plan? Should I have 20 page? Should I have 100 page? Should I have a 50 page? Should I have five page? Um, there, there's no wrong answer of this. I've seen 100 pages business plan. I've seen 50 pages business plan, and I've seen five pages business plan. My suggestion is if you just start, just write a five pages business plan. Have all the important information in there because you can always expand your bit um, based on what you think uh, what's important. And you can always expand your business plan. Uh, starting to write a business plan, a hundred pages business plan is probably just gonna discourage you and you probably never finish it. Uh, so my, my recommendation is write a five to 10 pages business plan, have all the structure, have the structure there and have more, the most important information in there. And then you can go back and look at each section and see what's more important. And you can start to write and improve each section. So executive summary. So what is the best? So executive summary, it is again, an overview of the business plan. Uh, it talk about all the key points. It save people time, right? Again, I mentioned people probably only have 30 seconds for you. It needs to be very, very concise. So what is the best way to start a executive summary? Um, I think some of you probably heard of this is start with a problem statement or start with the opportunity that you have identified, start with an issue that people are facing, right? Uh, let's just say um, a, um, try to think Uber, right? Uber, the reason why Uber started is because people a, are, sometimes people try to a look for a taxi driver, look for a taxi on the street and they probably wait for a very, very long time, but a taxi or a taxi is very expensive. Um, so there's a problem here and we'll really try to address that problem, right? So start with a problem is a very, very effective way to start executive summary. Um, there is research then uh, a, um, there are 80%, I think a lot of you probably heard of, 80% of small business fail in the first three years, right? That's the reality. Uh, for 10 people start a business, eight of them probably will fail. And the number one reason small business fail is because there is no demand for their product. And the reason why there's no demand for their, their product is because the, the entrepreneur or the small business owner have started a creative product, they actually thought it was addressing someone else's problem, but they're not. Right. If your product is not addressing, so if I'm not getting a benefit from your product or service, or I don't feel there's a need for your product and service, I'm not going to pay for it. So it's very, very important for any one of us who is starting a business, the people who are starting business today, think about what problem you're addressing for your customer. If there is no problem, there's no business. If there's no demand, there's no need, there's no business. Uh, so it's very, very important. And that's the part, if you start with that, uh, sometimes it's actually a very good start, uh, starting with a story, right? A lot of times we we, we're we starting a business because we have experienced something ourselves. Or our family, like my, my your parents or your friends have experienced something uh, themselves and ins inspire you to start this business. Uh, so think about, have write, write about that story. That would be a really good way to, to um, to talk about this problem statement, okay? And then you wanna talk about how does your business solve this problem? So there's a problem. If your, prob your business doesn't really solve that problem, there's no match, right? So talk about how your business actually go about sol solving this problem. Now, just because your business solve a problem doesn't mean this is a business, as a business, you still need to generate income so you can pay yourself, you can pay your employees, and you pay for all expenses. So revenue model is here to talk about how do you generate income, okay? How do you, so you have a business, just think about Facebook, right? Facebook have 
many, many followers and many users. But for a very, very long time, Facebook does not know how to generate income. They don't, they don't have a business. They didn't have a business model um, until they actually started doing advertising. So think about what is your business model? Is your business model advertising or is your business model subscription? Is your business, what is your business? How do you generate income? Financial highlights. So financial highlights would be, uh, if you're already in business, what is your revenue today? How, what is your revenue in the last, uh, last 12 months? How much, what's your revenue in the last two years? Now, and what is your, rev, what's your projection in the next one or two years? So financial highlights. If you are a brand new business, then you only have projections. So think, talk about what do you, what, how much you're planning to generate in the next six months, one year. Um, you can also talk about your financial from a uh, number of customer. Um, how many number of customers I wanted to have in the next one year? How many number of customers I want to have in the next two years? Um, a lot of times, if you are writing this business plan for a specific purpose, uh, you can always have a call to action here. Uh, for example, I'm writing this business plan because I'm looking for $200,000. Be very specific of how much you're asking for, what you need the money for. For example, I'm looking for $200,000 and I need to this $200,000 to hire two engineer. They need to, they both cost me $60,000 a year and I also need $20,000 for rent. So be very, very specific of what you, what you need this money for. Any questions? I'm, I'm actually just gonna look at the uh, chat and see if there are any questions. Hey, so there's no question. If any questions, please, just please feel free to put on the chat. So, so your product and service, we talk about how does your, how does your product address your customer's issue, right? How, does, how do they address your customer's issue? Talk about how does your product and service work. For some business, this could be very, very simple um, because your business could be pretty straightforward. But for some business, it requires quite a big explanation here. And this is the part where you can go very, very long or you can, it could be pretty short because it's pretty easy for people. Your business might be very easy for people to understand. Um, but for some business, this could be a, um, their business ideas are new, their business models are new, um, the products are new. So it, it could take a while for them for you to explain to people. And this is the part where you can really go a while and you can go uh, long and talk about how you how this how your product and service work how are they make how do they work how do you charge people how much do you charge people for this product and service ip protection um so why is the ip so important uh especially if you make a physical product your intellectual property is very important. If you create a product, if you don't provide intellectual property uh, to your product, and someone else can just create, uh, can copy it, and you know they they could probably do even do a better job making your product. Um, so for if an investor want to invest in your business, and you create a physical product, most likely they wanted to know that your business. Uh, your product has some kind of intellectual property protection to that business. Uh, okay. Uh, someone asked a question, BPP is this, how do I? Um, okay, I am, I don't know if that question is related to me, but, uh, um, Could you actually elaborate on that question a little bit? Um, and I'll come back to you. So, so that's, the, uh, that's the product and service of your business. Um, next section will be target market. Okay, so remember we talk about if you create a product, it's because there's a demand and usually this group of people that the demand, there's a certain group of people have this 
particular, this particular problem is actually um, facing by a certain group of people. So we call them target market, right? So this group of people particularly feeling this pain of a, a feeling this pain, so they will actually need to use your product or your service. Uh, target market is probably one of the most, it's very difficult to uh, determine, especially your new business, and sometimes you get it wrong, uh, which is completely fine, but it's always important to make that assumption in the beginning, because otherwise you have nothing to go by to actually create this business. Uh, but don't worry about, you might not get it right in the first time, once you start to sell your product, you, you gradually actually get a better grasp of what your target market is. So how do you define a target market? So there's diff this is market segmentation is a tool to help you define, define your target market. Um, so there's different way to segment your, your, your target market. So it could be based on geographic location. For example, I'm starting a restaurant that is in the mission of San Francisco and I, Think, I think that most likely people in my neighborhood is gonna to come to my restaurant or some, someone probably a little bit further will probably come. So geographic location, people are probably not gonna come from Denver to come to my restaurant. So that is a way to segment your, your, a, your target market. So I'm focusing on the neighborhood. Demographic is also another way for you to, to think about uh, your, your target market. So demographic could be a lot of different things that we usually use to, um, and, and I actually, when I was doing workshop with other, uh, some other group, and uh, one of the question come up was, is that, but I, I don't really wanted to use demographic to Simon, uh, my, uh, my customer, and that's okay. There's different, again, you, you, there are different way uh, tools here for you to Simon your target market. It does not have to just base on demographic. It could be based on lifestyle. Right, I'm starting a yoga yoga studio, or I'm actually selling organic food. So I'm focusing on people who are more health conscious. It might not necessarily be a certain age range. Um, sometimes there is, um, but usually the the way to segment this group of people is the lifestyle. They're more health conscious, right? Or I'm starting a a, a pro, starting up selling a product that probably will focusing on people who are more socially conscious. And that could be a way to segment your target customer. Um, again, it's okay to not get it right right away. Um, people, um, especially for a new business owner, a lot of times when they just start a business, they always feel like they have to get it right in the first time. You don't have to get it right in the first time. A lot of people is gonna make a lot of small mistake or even big mistake until they get their until they do it right. So it's okay not to get it right in the first time. Just make your best assumption and do research. Um, buying, uh, sorry, buying pattern could be another one. Dollar, for, for example, dollar store, right? They're focusing on people who's more price conscious. And that could be a way to sign in your target market. So why is a target market so important? Because target market will dictate how you do marketing which we'll talk about. So um, once you determine who you want to target, it's also very important to find out how big this group is. Why is it so important to find out how big this group is? So I'm sure, I'm sure that everyone here who want to start a business is because you at least at a minimum, you want to be financial independent, right? You want to generate enough income that you can pay yourself at least. Now, if you have identified a target market that's so small, let's just say I wanna sell a certain product and really even you penetrate the whole market, the total sales is gonna be probably $10,000 a year, you know it's not gonna be a viable business, right? So it's very important for you to actually find out um, how big this market is and a, so that's why we have this, concept is called total, total available market basically is the whole market, right? If this is a, uh, the whole market, that's not just necessarily available to you, to a competitor, the whole market. The serviceable, uh, sorry, serviceable available market is you as a business can reasonable reach out to. But still that is, 
because you have competitors in this market. So your share of market is also only a part of that. Is it possible to find out before I even start a business? Is it possible to find out how big this market is? Uh, it definitely is possible to find out uh, how big them to get a good understanding of how big this market is. And there's a few ways to do it. One is that you can actually get a lot of data from US census, can you get from um, Statistica if you actually part of uh, Actually, even San Francisco Public Library, there's probably a lot of database for you to, for example, I wanted to sell organic pet food in San Francisco. A few things I can probably find out. One is how big the pet food industry in the, is in the US. I don't know, maybe 20 billion, right? So I can find that out because there is data out there. And I can probably even know how many pet owners are there in San Francisco. And that's another thing that I can probably find out because data is already out there. And how many people, how much money people spend on the pet, that's also another information of, like you could probably find out. How many people will spend money on organic pet food? I probably don't know. Let's just make an assumption here. Let's just say in San Francisco, there is about 150,000 pet owners. And each pet owner spends about um, a thousand dollars a year on uh, pet food. I can't do the math. It's probably like 15 million or something like that. Um, but I still don't know how many people will buy organic pet food, right? So you look at 15 million, you, you're thinking that's great. That's a pretty good industry to get into because I can make 15 million dollars. But it's not necessarily true because one, you have a competitors Two, you probably, not everyone want to buy organic pet food. So how do I find that one out? You're probably not going to be able to find that information. So what do you do in this case? You will do something we call primary research, primary market research. So what is primary market research? Is you go out to get those data yourself. So I'll give you one example based on this, a, um, based on our, this, organic pet food uh, a example. So I'll probably create a survey and I'm gonna send the survey to a whole bunch of friends and I'm gonna ask them to share with their friend and ask their friend to share with their friend, um, maybe through Facebook or through other email or other channel. Now you're gonna get a whole bunch of a uh, survey back, right? So you might ask questions such as, do you have a pet? How much money you spend on pet? Uh, on your pet, on pet food every year. Or a uh, very important, you want to find out, would you buy organic pet food? How much you want to pay for organic pet food? And, um, and uh, or would you only buy organic pet food? You're going to ask these questions, right? So once you get the survey back, uh, you'll probably find out of this 1,000 people, um, 500 of them are pet owner, and only 10 of them Let's say, let's say they only they will only buy organic pet food. Now, I can't do the math now in my head. So two of 500, uh, 500 people, and there's only two of them. So what, that's 0.2%. And then your total market is 14 million, 0.2%. It's pretty small. So you realize that even I penetrate the whole market, it's going to be a pretty small market. What does that tell? So what you have to you have a decision to make at that point. One is, is that, well, I don't get into this business because it's so small. It's probably about one hundred fifty thousand dollars. I can't get into this business because it's too small of a market for me to get into. Two is, is that maybe I need to do some adjustment to my business plan so that I can penetrate. I can um, I can have a bigger market, or I have to adjust my expectation and say, I would be okay with you. Some people probably be okay with $150,000 a year in revenue. And that would be okay for them. So if you have to make a decision once you do that. But this is actually a very useful tool for people. When you just start a business, it's always good to go through this. Um, so once you have the target market, so let's just say I want to target senior, right? My target market is senior. 
So why is it so important for me to know that my target market is senior? Because senior is getting their information through different channel. What they want to hear is probably different. And the, um, um, the, re the way to reach out to them is going to be different. So your marketing plan is really dictated by your target market. So you really want to find out where your target market is before you get into actually um, uh, come up with your marketing uh, strategy or marketing plan. So I always tell people there are two key to your marketing plan. One is your marketing channel and one is your a marketing message, right? So your marketing channel could be, how, how do you reach out to, again, I'm gonna use senior as an example. Uh, a lot of seniors are, um, actually I don't know, like it's, it's, uh, um, there are a lot of seniors still getting their information by um, through TV, a cable TV. Right, uh, some of them on social media now. Some of them, they probably use Facebook more. They probably don't use TikTok. They probably, we don't know, but you can actually find that one out. Uh, based on who your target market is, you're gonna come up with a strategy is, I'm gonna use certain channel and I'm gonna actually um, create a certain, my branding, my logo, my marketing message, all these things are gonna design around this marketing, the target market, the, the market you wanna target. Um, so was your marketing plan is always good to come up with the marketing goal first. Okay, so it's always, think, it's always good to think about what is my marketing goal? I'm gonna give you one example of what your marketing goal could look like. So, so example, my marketing goal is in the next six months, I wanted to reach out to 200,000 people. Or oh, I wanna have 200,000 followers to in my a Instagram, right? Now you have a specific goal to work, uh, work towards. So it's always good to set up a goal and then you can start a uh, set up action plan to help you achieve that goal. And it's also uh, important to think about the cost and also think about the responsibilities, who's doing what. And, and this is something I actually came across quite a bit is a lot of small business owners do not wanna do marketing. A lot of small business owner, they, especially social media, media marketing, a lot of them don't wanna do social media, media marketing and they don't want to, they don't have the time to do it. And that's completely okay. Um, there is one thing of being a small business owner is about Understand what you're good at and what you what you are not good at, and being okay to let go of some of your responsibility to other people to do right. Hiring an intern, hiring a part time, or or even just outsource your marketing to someone else. Dude, there's a lot of marketing company out there, uh, so think about that. Um, I'm gonna quickly just jump into answer some of the questions. Uh, 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 someone say, does this target market strategy apply to all types of business activity? Uh, yes, uh, I'm personally a big fan of all business activity should connect. I know that a lot of different business function, uh, you know, you have marketing department, you have finance department, but if they don't understand each other, you just, you won't have a business that's function well. So I think your marketing strategy should should be you should convey your marketing strategy with all your de uh, company department if you have multiple uh, departments. Um, I'm not sure if uh, Christine is back. Uh, I might not be able to monitor the chat for now. Uh, uh, Christine, if you're back, please send me a, a private message. Um, so. Understand your industry is also very important. So that's another component of your a business plan is understanding your industry and your competitor, okay? And I always hear people say, well, I don't really wanna, I don't really feel like I need to compete with other people. Uh, unfortunately, if you are, you're starting a business and you, in a way, one way or the other, you are competing with someone else. If you don't have a competitor, you should be worried because if you don't have a competitor, chances are there's there's no demand for this product. 
So you actually should be worried if you don't have a competitor. So, and someone, some people say, well, I'm just a small business, local small business. Why does, why does the whole industry so important to me? Uh, let me give you one example. Um, I think some of you probably don't know Blockbuster if you're really young, but you know many of us know Blockbuster, right? Blockbuster used to be pretty much every street corner. I used like I used to enjoy going to Blockbuster, but they when Netflix is completely took over, Blockbuster have went bankrupt, and they completely closed every single store. And that is a great lesson of someone or business don't understand the industry trend and they don't focus on the industry trend. And they will actually, um, so when Netflix started, and I think, I think they actually have an opportunity to purchase Netflix and, and they have rejected because they didn't feel Netflix will ever uh, become a viable business, but they actually, the one actually went bankrupt. So understanding industry is important. Let's just say I'm thinking about getting to the industry to start a DVD business. And if I actually do an industry research, I realize that, well, it's probably not the right industry for me to get into, right? Because the industry is going down. So understanding industry is under, it's about understanding the trend of the industry with different opportunity that could be um, present in the industry. Um, if you are B2B business, I'm not sure if any one of you are B2B business. If your clients are other business, your client's business is also important. If your clients are in the dying industry, the chances is that you're, it's going to affect your business as well. So it's very important to understand your business, and it's always very important to understand your, your customer's business as well. Um, Another very important part of your a industry competitor analysis is doing a SWOT analysis, which I will actually get into do um, get into a little bit more. So, what is SWOT analysis? Uh, I think some of you probably already heard of SWOT analysis. You probably have done SWOT analysis in the past. So SWOT stands for strengths weakness, opportunity, and threat, okay? This is probably one of the most useful, of, this is probably one of the easiest to learn strategy tool um, that you can have is SWOT analysis. And it can help you form a business strategy for your business. Strengths and weakness is internal to your business. Opportunity and threat are external to your business. So let me give you um, let me give you one uh, example. Let's just say I'm starting a uh, I'm starting a uh, no I'm sorry I have a, I, let's just say I'm oh I own a ski resort in Lake Tahoe. My strengths could be I have great customer service. So again, strengths is internal. I have great customer service. Um, the the equipment I have a are really high quality. Um, the location I have is great, right? So these are your strengths. They make you stand out among your competitors. Now, weakness. Weakness could be, I don't have a lot of financial backing. So if, you know, if my, my company is not generating any income next, next month, I might actually um, go under. Or it could be my customer service really bad. I don't think anyone will admit their customer service bad, but customer service, bad customer service, it is one of the weakness. Um, opportunity is external. Let's just say um, global warming. Global warming has a, because of global warming, this year in Lake Tahoe, there is no snow. There is no snow. There's very little snow. And because there is very little snow, actually, so this is a, actually a threat. So they create a threat to not just me, to all ski resorts in, uh, in, in Lake Tahoe. So this, this is an external factor. factor. It's most likely it's going to affect most of the business uh, in this industry, in the same location in this case. 
opportunity could be, uh, again, I'm gonna use the pet food, organic pet food as an example. Let's just say more and more pet owner is moving into San Francisco. That create opportunity to my business, but it's also create opportunity to, to my competitor, right? So a lot of times opportunity and threat are something that applies to both you and your competitor who is doing something similar. So, as I mentioned earlier, so the, the core of the business, a quarter business identify your customer, um, your customer opportunity and align your strengths and competency with those opportunity. And SWOT analysis can help really help you do that. So usually what I recommend people do is list out the top three strengths your company has. And then think about these strengths. Does it really connect to what your customer need? Now, let's just say, for example, right? A, um, I am an NBA basketball player. I'm really good at playing basketball, right? So I'm tall and I have really good skill playing basketball. But I'm starting a fast food restaurant. And um, so me, really good at playing basketball, does it align to what my customer need, which is a good burger? Probably not. Uh, so you really wanted to align your strengths with, with your customers. So think about the top strengths you have and then come back and think about, does it really match my customer's uh, demand or what my customers need? That would be a competitive advantage. I think a lot of you probably heard of that term. It is your competitor. What is your competitive advantage? Is competitive advantage is something that you are doing better than your competitor to help you stand out among your competitor. Um, I'm actually going to share, I will share the slide to, um, with every one of you so you can see some example here. Uh, but let's just do a really quick. Uh, SWOT is really important part of the business plan. So I kind of want to spend a little bit more time on this. So uh, because it's really a, a, a a strategy part of your business plan. So think about strengths. Think about what things your company is doing well. Think about the qualities that separate you from your competitor. Think about the internal resources such as skill, knowledge. Uh, think about tangible assets that your business have, intellectual property, capital, um, technology, all those things. The weakness, think about what your company is lack what, what your company lacks. Think about the things that your competitor is doing better than you. Think about, think about the resource limitation. I mentioned finance, financing already. A, think about you might, what is unclear the unique value proposition? Meaning that you, your customer don't know what you're selling. Your customer don't know how they can benefit from your product. And that's a very, very, uh, um, important mistake a lot of small business make as well. They don't they don't understand how to convey that message to your customer to their customer. Um, that how can they? Why would their customer buy their product from them, not from someone else? What kind of value they're providing to their customer? And they're not able to convey that message. People still don't buy their product. Um, opportunity. Actually, opportunity and threat, I'm gonna use the other slide to tell you a little bit more. Again, there's more example here, uh, which I will, I'll share the slide with you so you can see more example here. The best way to do, to do SWOT analysis was just, would be just like this. Create a chart or create a table and then just put, my recommendation is put yourself on the table and then put two or three of your competitor on the table as well and then one of the very important things is don't overthink it. Because one of the thing people do is when they think about a, one of their weakness, they will want to quickly think about how do I address this weakness? What, you're, what you try to do now at this stage is not try to do that. It's just list everything out, okay? At the early stage, try to list everything out. Everything that you think it's, uh, that come to your mind, just list them out here. Again, list yourself and two or three competitors there's the strengths, weakness, opportunity, and threats in this chart. 
Um, I already talked about how you look for actually. So actually, um, again, you, you can look at your company strengths winners through your product, your service, pricing. Um, my price is really good. Uh, your distribution channel could be very good. Um, we talk about Amazon. I think probably one of the biggest advantage Amazon have is their is the way they they deliver the product, logistic, right? And that's very important. Your marketing, sales, company function, your process, great people, your company have great people, um, different partners, infrastructure. So you can look at your strengths and winners from these different area. The resources, core competency, um, capabilities, um, all these things. Where do you look for um, opportunity and threat? There is actually a, a term here. It's called P-E-S-T-E-L. Political, econo economic, social, technology, environment, and legal. So one example. So the reason why Netflix was, was able to um, make Blockbuster obsolete was because of technology. And the reason why Blockbuster didn't want to buy Netflix was because they didn't believe internet could be fast enough. People can watch high quality uh, video through a, uh, um, a streaming. Technology evolved, right? A lot of things actually uh, have become obsolete because of the technology change. So technology is a big part that can create opportunity and also can create threat. A, um, environmental change. We talked about earlier global warming, legal, right? So for example, um, California had legalized marijuana and that creates some opportunity for some people, but it also creates some threat to some other business because a, for some business that they have been running a cannabis business for a long time, now they suddenly have a lot more competitor, right? So all these things, if you're doing a business in a, in a in a country where the, the political environment is more is less stable, that can create a threat to your business. So this is a through P E S T E L. That's where you can look for opportunity and threat for your business and people's tastes, people's lifestyle change, people's taste change. All these things gonna affect a um, uh, create opportunity and threat to your business. So there is more example here about how to create a SWOT. Um, again, I'm going to share that in a slide. So the next slide, the next section of your business plan is organizational development plan. Organization of development plan for some of you could be really simple because um, I know some of you here probably you want to be a freelancer, you have no interest in hiring employee, you have no, um, you not try to grow into a large company. So your organization of development plan could be pretty simple, you're just going to write about yourself. Um, is it important to write about yourself? Yes. Um, a, a lot of times if you say, for instance, you reach out to an investor, if you reach out to a lender, they want to know you have the competency to run, to become a, to be a successful business owner. So this is where, for many of you here, this is where you want to talk about your experience, your expertise, talk about your passion about running this business. Now, if your goal is to actually hiring other people and you want to talk about your hiring plan, who, who do you want to hire first? Why do you want to hire this, this person first? How are you going to dedicate your work? The cost of hiring your employee. And your company uh, culture. The company culture really um, make a difference in terms of like how you, who you're going to attract to work for your company. Uh, so I know a lot of business plan don't mention company culture. I personally have decided to put it here because I really think company culture make a very difference in terms of how you actually talk to your customer and also how do you talk to your employees. Um, so that is your organizational development plan. Again, it could be really simple. It could be pretty complex if you want to develop a larger organization. 
operational plan. And that's another session that could be very, very simple. Uh, I assume that some of you here are um, maybe a professional service provider like myself. Uh, my operational plan is super simple, right? Because we don't we don't really have a, a we don't have a fit necessarily have to have a retail uh, space or location. Um, we don't have a lot. We don't have inventory we have to deal with. We don't have distribution. We don't have production that we have to deal with. So a lot of um, a, a professional service provider, your operational plan is super simple. But for some of you, um, if you have a retail store, if you're a manufacturer, if you provide pro uh, produce product, your operational plan is going to be pretty complex. And that's where you want to talk about it. So talk about your location, talk about your retail store, talk about where you're going to get your inventory, talk about where you're going to get, get your product made, how you're going to make your product, how you're going to distribute your product. Why are these important? Because a business an efficient operate efficient business operation can save a business a lot of money, and um, if your business is not running efficiently, even though you're generating a lot of income, uh, you still can be not profitable. And um, restaurant is a really good example, right? A lot of people want to start a restaurant, and one of the biggest challenges with restaurant is operation. And the reason why it's really hard to manage your restaurant is because there's a lot of product, there are a lot of um, a expenses they have. Uh, for example, their ingredients or their labor costs are all perishable, right? So if you have a purchase a ingredient, if you're not using in two days, then you're gonna go back. Or if you have an employee, uh, but you don't have a customer, you still have to pay for these employees. Now you're actually putting money in uh, and you're not making money. So operation is actually very important. And that's why a lot of restaurants, even though they're, they're running, but they're not generating income because they're not able to manage their operations. Operation is actually a very important part of your business plan. Really think through how you, how you, how you are going to create a efficient uh, operational plan so that your business that can so you can minimize the cost of your business and you can have a more profitable uh, business. Uh, one really good example is Dell Computer. A lot of you probably don't even know what Dell Computer is um, because they haven't been out there. But Dell Computer, when they have started, they have a very good inventory management system where they do not make a computer until someone make an order, right? So I don't know if you have our Dell computer before you go to their website, you you tell them what you want to order. You want different kind of uh, the um, technology uh, in their computer, and you order, it and they will make that computer. So for them, there is no inventory, and that minim minimizes the inventory cost. And that's your operational plan. Um, the last but not least will be your financial plan. So remember I told, told you earlier, your, um, if someone will only read one part of your business plan, that will be your executive summary. If they have time, actually most likely they will also read your financial plan. That's probably the second most important part of your business plan, it is your financial plan. Uh, a lot of times people is gonna attach a financial, uh, a, a income projection, a, um, sheet to the financial plan will look just like this. Uh, I created this. Um, and you could probably download it um, um, online as well, um, but I did create this template here. Um, the financial projection is really telling people your expenses, your revenue in the next couple of years, but there's more to your uh, uh, a financial plan. So the financial plan, first, you want to talk about how do you generate revenue, right? So your revenue model. So your revenue model could be I'm selling a product, I'm doing advertising, subscription fee, I'm charging a subscription fee, I'm, or I'm doing a combination of both. We always talk about multiple revenue stream now, right? For every business, you can always think about, you don't have to, but you can always think about, am I able to create a, another revenue stream? For example, myself, right? I am a business consultant. 
So my revenue stream, if you really look at it, it's pretty straightforward, right? I, I consult my client and I charge them the hourly rate and they pay me. But I've seen a lot of small a, a business consultant now, what they do is, for example, they will create a process. I don't know a while ago, I was reached out to a, another business consulting company and they create a process to value a company. Com uh, they provide valuation. So for example, I want to sell my company and they will come in and they will provide and put a value of your company. And they create this process and they create a certificate and they, they start to sell this, uh, I guess they, 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 they license this process and they start to um, sell this license. And they reach out to me and say, hey, do you want to be part of this license? We'll charge you $500 a year and you can actually um, become part of revenue uh, sorry, evaluation consultant, valuation consultant. Of course, I didn't, I didn't want to be part of it, but I thought that's a great business model, right? So even for business consultant, you can think about, can I actually make my service a physical product? Now I actually can generate more income. Um, same as a fitness trainer, right? Can I, a fitness trainer, you charge people $100 an hour, but can I do group section or can I also create videos and, and, uh, and people can subscribe to my video? Or can I even sell physical product through my physical training section? So there's a lot of revenue stream you can think about. Um, sometimes it's about think outside the box. You probably think about different uh, things. Now, pricing strategy is something that I'm not going to talk about today, but there's a lot of different pricing strategy you can implement. Right. For example, a um, I try to think uh, pricing penetration. That could be one of the pricing strategy. Uh, you try to occupy the market, so you lower your price at the beginning, um, and lower your price than your competitor, and um, so that you can actually penetrate the market. So that is one of your pricing pricing strategy. Or another way to uh, another pricing strategy is premium pricing. Right. Think about Apple computer. Apple computer, do you think if Apple, do you think Apple will be more successful? They actually lower their computer to all their computer to $800. Each MacBook will be $800. They're probably not going to be more successful because, and I, I think they actually tried to do that a few years ago with one of the iPhone and they quickly just um, actually uh, just, ah, just continue that, that model of iPhone. So that's premium pricing, right? Um, Mercedes Benz, um, Gucci, or a BMW. These are all great examples of premium pricing. So think about what is your pricing strategy. Um, I do have a different workshop talk about, especially talk about finance, where I will teach you about different uh, pricing strategy. Um, but think about what is your pricing strategy here. Um, think about what is your profit margin. So. Profit margin is basically saying how profitable is your business. For example, um, I sell my, I made furniture, I made chairs, and I sell $100 per chair. And it costs me $80 to make the chair. So my profit is $20, right? So 20 divided by 100. So my profit margin, profit margin is always a, um, a percentage. So my profit margin, 20%. Not too bad, right? We always want to compare. So if I'm a furniture maker, I want to compare to other furniture maker to, to know how profitable I am. If your business is not profitable enough, you, def you definitely want to look at why my business is not profitable. Am I charging too low or is my cost too high? If my cost is too high, how can I reduce my cost? Another thing you want to talk about in your financial plan, especially for people, or well, it's not especially, for people who is starting a a new business owner, you want to talk about, you want to, you can create um, a table and list out everything you need to start a business, okay? That could be registration, permit. I think someone has a question about permit on the, on the list, but list uh, on the chat, but permit, license, prepay rent, maybe leasehold improvement, uh, equipment purchase, initial inventory. So there's one thing a lot of people forget. So I've seen that a lot. People, they get a place, they buy the inventory, and they start to run the business. 
but they have nothing left in their bank account. And they completely forgot that your business is probably not going to generate enough money, enough income to pay yourself or pay all expenses, maybe for two months, maybe for three months, maybe for six months, or maybe for one year, it really depends on what industry you're in. So you wanted to, you wanted to uh, a, a come up with some initial working capital that will cover some of the expenses for again, three months to six months really depends on your business, could be even longer. I was talking to a small business owner. She said she had prepared six, 12 month working capital because she, she's, she's, she felt that for the first 12 months, she's not gonna be able to generate enough income. And that's one of the problem with small people start a small business is they didn't prepare that. We all seen that happen that people start a small business after six months, they run out of money, they have to go back to look for a job. Right, so really think about list this so you understand how much money you need. If you do need to borrow money, uh, at least you know now you know how much money you need to borrow. So, financial financial projection again. This is this sheet that I just created for you. So really, it's just lists of how much money you can generate every month. If you're seasonal business, some months going to be lower than certain month. Your cost of goods sold. Okay, cost goods so is basically the direct material and labor that, that is actually going to make your product. And then all other expenses, uh, salary, um, a marketing, insurance, all those expenses. That, that will actually give you the end is your net income. So income is your, the revenue is your top line revenue. In, income, net income is your bottom line. So how much money after you make, you make $100,000 to pay $80,000 in expenses, at the end of the year, you $20,000 in your hand. That's what you have left to pay yourself um, as a business owner. Um, your investor or the bank, the investor want to know that they can actually, by investing in your business, they can actually um, get a good return. Now for a uh, loan, uh, sorry, for a lend, uh, lending company or for a bank, they want to make sure that your business generate enough income so you can pay them every month, right? So your financial projection is very, very important. Um, I also actually attached this, this great thing here. Someone asked for nonprofit. So there is actually a specific business plan, that template that you can use to write a business plan. It's actually very similar for a for-profit business. They call it differently, like target market, target audience. Uh, so they call it slightly different, but it's quite similar. And there is a link here, uh, take you to the template to write a, a business plan for a nonprofit, which we also support at the LGBT Center. That is it for the business um, plan presentation. Um, do you have any questions? Uh, I think you can even, if you wanna, uh, if you wanna even just raise your hand, um, I can uh, just call you on Patty. Um, okay. Uh, Silva, Siva. Sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your name correctly. So you need to unmute yourself. I'm sorry, Suba. You need to unmute yourself on the, on the left bottom. Uh, uh, oh, you cannot un unmute yourself? Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, there you go. Can yeah. you can you uh, can you put down the screen so we can see everybody? Uh, well, you have control of your screens for you to see everybody. Uh, it's gonna be um, it's gonna be the control is on your screen. So we all um, control our own. I see uh, questions. Eddie Tang. Mm -hmm. Uh, how can I move the, 
Okay, you're hi, right. Hi, Eddie. This is Anissa from the library. I hi, just Anissa. wanted to jump in and, and do let you know we have closed our library, but I'm here to help you finish out your program if okay. you need anything. All right, let, let me just uh, ask for feedback here. So, Eddie. Yeah. Uh, right now I'm sitting in my home in San Mateo, but I used to live in San Francisco and I taught math in, for the San Francisco Unified School District. Did you go to school in San Francisco? I did. I did my master's in the uh, University no, of No, no, no. Elementary school. Oh, oh, you said school. I apologize. No, I didn't. <laughs> okay. Well, that's usually the case. People who grew up in San Francisco can't afford to live there, they, they're gone. Yep. And, uh, but when I was teaching at the secondary level, like Everett Junior High School, Lincoln High School, what I realized is that most of my students did not understand basic first grade addition and subtraction. It was just memorization and no thinking skills. Like if you're adding nine and four, they know, they did know you start with nine and you go 10, 11, 12, 13. But to break the four into a one and a three and add the nine and the one and make 10 and three. The problem is for all people who speak English and all the related languages, uh, the numbers from 11, 12, 13, 14, they don't make any sense because they're, they're 11 is just a meaningless noise. The most important thing is to start with counting stuff and uh, to understand we have a packaging system. We count to 10 and then we start 10 and one more, 10 and two more. Okay, that's my point. That to prevent these bad habits, I have invented. So, so Silva, uh, let, let, let me let me finish. I've, I've invented these playing cards and games to play with the cards, where there's these special icons. I call them visual math numerals that combine the basic Hindu Arabic numerals with a picture. So you see that eleven is ten and one more, and then you play various games. And by playing the games and, and thinking in this critical thinking way gives you a foundation for math educate for, for having a strong educational background that you can end up, this, this forms that you've had people fill out. This makes a lot of sense. So Silva, I'm so sorry for interrupt you. Uh, I wanna make sure that we leave enough time for every- Okay, let me just ask the question. The question uh, is, mm -hmm. in your experience, have you seen a need for people to learn critical thinking, basic math skills, when they're little kids, right? Rather than getting into a business and failing, you see a need. Uh, I think there is definitely a need, but um, I can tell you that what I think is not important because I'm just. Well, I, my guess is that when you were in first grade, you you understood math. Yeah. So so Silva, I'm so sorry. I'm more than happy to meet with you one on one because I okay. feel like this is a brainstorming. Got it. Got it. I do brainstorming all the time with people. Um, I would love to answer more questions related to the workshop. And, and also as people are leaving, I, I'm sorry, I didn't say bye to some people, but as people are leaving, I wanted to thank you all for being in the workshop if you were, if you were leaving uh, and uh, feel free to reach out to me, but uh, I'm going to stay here uh, till, uh, you know, till 3.30. Uh, as you get more questions, feel free to uh, raise your hand and I'll call you. Right. Um, yeah, so feel free to ask questions. Um, 
the, uh, again, thank you so much uh, for being part of this workshop. And um, uh, feel free to reach out to me uh, if you have uh, any questions, if you need support through the LGBT Center, um, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Um, and I, I really enjoyed the, the workshop today. And I thank you um, for the San Francisco Public Library for hosting this and provide, providing this great uh, resources to people uh, in San Francisco. Absolutely, thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Again, I'm gonna stay till three, should I just stay, stay till 3.30? Uh, just if any questions, uh, again, about anything, okay. feel free to the, raise your hand. Uh, can we have a, a meeting, a Zoom meeting or an in-person meeting? Uh, I would ask you, so I believe Christy is gonna share uh, my slide with everyone who registered the workshop. And then on the slide, there is a my contact information. Uh, so you can definitely always uh, reach out to, to me uh, through my email and we can talk about how we uh, can provide further support to you. Okay, sounds mm -hmm. good, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, again, I, I Chris, uh, oh, sorry, Christy's not here. Um, Christy's not, yeah, I don't think she is here. <laughs> but, you know, if you have any library questions, I can try to help you. Yeah, um, uh, I, I guess I was thinking Christy probably would um, send my um, a slide to people, right, I believe, and so they have my contact, because I didn't share my contact on, on the chat. Um, um, yeah, your con well, your contact is right there. So hopefully, if they wrote it down, they can put that mm -hmm. in the chat. <laughs> but yes, I will talk to Christy tomorrow and see if we can send all the participants a follow up email along with the slides and anything else that um, folks are looking for. And uh, again, yes, thank you for for all being here. It was a, a weird one when the building evacuated. <laughs> Um, I hope everything's okay in the library, but uh, I have someone raise their hand. I just want to quickly probably answer their question. Uh, Hakika? Hi, thank you. Thank you for the presentation, Eddie. I have a question when it comes to uh, failure and trying again. Uh, if you have a business plan, if you're proposing business plans to different, um, you know, investors or banks or for loans and things like that um, and they keep shutting down at what point do we do you feel we should uh, change our direction versus our approach or just keep running into the wall till we bust through I think you should always actually uh, think about you know how do you adjust your approach uh, but I, I would you know I think it's important to understand why, uh, like in terms of like bank or investor, why they reject your uh, reject your idea. Um, personally, if I really strongly believe, and that's that's one thing I found about you know the, just from the small business owner I help, uh, I felt like there is one kind of small business owner I really admire is that it doesn't matter who tell them what they will keep pushing forward, uh, and a lot of these are the one actually succeed. You know, people will tell them they're crazy, the business idea is crazy. Um, they do not care because they, they really believe what they do and they will keep pushing forward. Um, so um, does it make sense? Um, I, I don't have a lot of contests like uh, why people will uh, reject your idea. Um, I will ask for feedback. You know, if I was you, I, I will ask for feedback why do they think this is not a viable business? Because um, remember I mentioned earlier, 80% um, of small business fail in the first uh, three years, but I actually want to rephrase that. The, I think the more accurate way to say it is many of them, not 80% of small business fail, now, a lot of them just quit, right? Um, you could really just make adjustment to your business and become a successful business, but a lot of people just decided to quit, so. Does it make sense? Yes, yes, that definitely makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.
Eddie, there is a question, the mute button. Uh, Elena, are you able to, she, are you able to type your question into the chat? I see that you can't uh, disable the phone. And so I, I remember, um, yeah, so the, um, Christine has had started recording as long as we started a, pro a program. So I think Christine uh, has the recording um, and she can definitely send, send it out. And I will email her my slide as well. So she can record, send out the slide and the recording at the same time to people who register for the course uh, program. If they, you know, if they wanted to come back and watch it again. Um, Thank you, Eddie. That's really generous of you. Yeah, I mean, it's not a problem at all. Uh, um, um, Elena, I could not unmute. I hope pretty sure Eddie would not be opposed to sharing what he recorded. Yeah, I think the only challenge is that uh, she want us to send to her like right now, which probably is not, I'm not able to do it just because I don't have access to any one of your content, only Christine, uh, Christine have, and I can send the my uh, slide to her and I don't think she's gonna have time. She's able to send everything out today. Um, oh yeah, our library has closed. So yeah. I am joining you from a remote location. Uh, okay, okay. Elena said by tomorrow night was fine. Um, Okay, yeah, so again, Elena, I don't have access to uh, everyone's contact information. Uh, so I'll send it to a Christine and uh, she will forward, forward, uh, she will forward, uh, forward to everyone here. Great. Uh, yeah, so 331, thank you all um, for a, being part of this workshop and thank you again, uh, San Francisco Public Library. Thank you, Eddie, and thank you, um, library community, for being patient during all this. This and Eddie, thank you for just taking on over. We we appreciate you, and we you know we live by the show must go on motto <laughs> in virtual land. Yeah. And I will too follow up with Kirsty and give her all of the great feedback and that you all want all this information. I will tell her. Perfect. All right, friends and Eddie, you have control, so you're gonna go ahead and end it. I'm gonna, sorry, one second. I'm gonna, yes, I'm gonna stop, stop recording.